Welcome to a new episode of the True Crime Edition. This week, we'll be looking at the terrifying beast of Jersey. The islanders of Jersey locked their doors, but nothing could stop the boogeyman from entering their homes, and no one would forget his mask. Famous for its woolen trade and cows, Jersey is smaller than the greater London region. At only nine miles wide by five miles long, the tiny island is part of the sovereign state of the United Kingdom and sits in the channel between England and France. Its population in the 1950s was just over 30,000 inhabitants. The island faced a dark and fearsome time between 1957 and 1971, when one man in a frightening mask terrified the residents and left his mark on the island forever. He would be known as the Beast of Jersey. In 1957, a nurse was waiting for a bus on the island. Dressed in a long coat and a scarf over his face, a man approached her and beat her over the head, tied a rope around her neck and sexually assaulted her in a nearby field. She was severely injured during the attack and needed stitches. However, she was discovered and taken to the hospital, where she recovered from her physical wounds. The man attacked a 20-year-old woman in March 1957, who was walking home from the bus stop near Trinity. He used the same method with her and pulled her into a field by her neck and assaulted her. In July, he attacked a 31-year-old and then a 28-year-old in St. Martin's in October 1959. After the attacks, the victims gave their statements to the police and all of them had repetitive themes. They all confirmed the man was around 5 feet 6 inches in his mid 40 and had a strange Irish accent that they believed was fake. They also described him as musty smelling. Police agreed that the same man had attacked them all, and he became known in the press as the Beast of Jersey. In 1960, he changed his attack pattern and began breaking into houses and assaulting people in their homes instead of on the streets. No one was safe. On the 14th of February, the Beast of Jersey climbed through the window of a house and into an upstairs bedroom. The boy whose room he entered was only 12 years old. When he woke up, he saw the man in a mask standing at the foot of his bed, holding a torch to his face, blinding him. The man placed a rope around the boy's neck and dragged him outside to a field where he raped him. When the assault was over, the man led the boy back to his house and disappeared. In March, a woman walking to a bus stop in St. Brelade stopped to speak to a man who had stopped his car and offered her a lift. He said he was a doctor on his way to pick up his wife. The woman accepted the ride and got in the rover, and the two drove off. When she turned to speak to the man, she realized he was wearing a big overcoat, hat, and gloves. She couldn't see his face, and when she understood the mistake she'd made, he had already driven them to a secluded part of the island. He beat the woman, punching her hard and tied her hands behind her back. He then led her out of the car into a field. Once he had finished sexually assaulting her, he led her back to the car, Realizing that this was her chance to escape, the woman jumped out of the moving vehicle and began to scream. Panicked by the noise, the man sped away. Later that month, a 43-year-old woman and her 14-year-old daughter were asleep in their cottage in a remote part of the island in St. Martin's. The mother was awoken after midnight to the phone ringing downstairs. She got out of bed to answer it, but there was silence on the other end followed by a click in the dial tone. Assuming it was a wrong number, she went back to bed. A while later, she was awoken again by a noise. She went back down the stairs to investigate the strange sound, turning on the lights to see better. When she reached the bottom step, the lights went out, and she realized she wasn't alone. There was someone in the living room, so she picked up the phone to call the local police, but the line was dead. The phone line had been cut. The figure in the living room ran at the woman, demanded her money, and threatened to kill her. In the struggle, her daughter awoke to hear the noise and went to see what was going on. Seeing the young girl, the man let go of the woman and lunged up the stairs to the daughter. The woman, now free, ran to her neighbor's home and brought them back to the cottage to catch the intruder. But when they arrived, they found the daughter alone. She had been tied up and raped, but she was still alive. Throughout the year, several other incidents of a man assaulting women and children were reported. The assaults were recorded, but with no suspect to chase, 
the police were dumbfounded. Investigators realized that the Beast of Jersey had to be a resident of the island due to the frequency of the attacks. They began to interview every man who had a criminal record, but none of them fit the description the victims made. Officers also requested fingerprints from all the adult males on the island. They had a right to refuse, and 13 of them did. One of them was the masked man. Jersey police arrested a local fisherman for the attacks and rapes. The police were grasping at straws, and any eccentric characters needed to be looked into. After 14 hours of questioning, he was released due to lack of evidence. But the damage was done. His name had been given to the press, and his picture was all over the local news. After an angry mob burned his house down, the fisherman was forced to flee to a group of islands northeast of Jersey. He died in June 2012 at the age of 97. In February 1961, the attacks began again, but this time, the Beast of Jersey's pattern changed, and instead of attacking different generations, he targeted children solely, and by April, three young children had been taken from their homes and attacked. By this point, the local police knew they were fighting a losing battle, so they called Scotland Yard to help with the investigation. Scotland Yard told residents that they needed to look out for each other and set up neighborhood watches to keep each other safe. They also created a profile of the attacker from the descriptions made by the victims. He was 40 to 45 years old and approximately 5 foot 6 inches in height with a medium build. He knew the island well, especially the east coast. He had a moustache but covered his face, either with a scarf or a mask during the attacks. He wore a long, dark, musty coat, a hat and a pair of gloves. He entered homes through bedroom windows, using the moon as a light, between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. and carried a torch. Despite the profile, investigators hit dead end after dead end, and eventually the attacks stopped for a few years. Two years later, in April 1963, a nine-year-old boy was the next victim of the masked man. In November, the same happened to an 11-year-old boy. In 1964, during July and August, a 10-year-old girl and a boy of the same age were attacked in their homes too. For the next two years, the Beast of Jersey stayed in the shadows and life went on as usual. Finally, neighborhoods began to calm their self-policing and it appeared that the attacks were over. In 1966, the police received a letter from the Beast of Jersey. My dear sir, I think that it is just the time to tell you that you are just wasting your time, as every time I have done what I always intended to do, and remember it will not stop at this, but I will be fair to you and give you a chance. I have never had much out of this life, but I intend to get everything I can now. I have always wanted to do the perfect crime. I have done this, but this time let the moon shine very bright in September, because this time it must be perfect, not one but two. I am not a maniac by a long shot, but I like to play with you people. You will hear from me before September, and I will give you all the clues, just to see if you can catch me. Yours very sincerely, wait and see. In August, a 15-year-old girl was brutally assaulted in her home, but the attack was different this time. The girl's body was covered in long scratches that were perfectly dispersed in parallel lines. After this attack, there were no more incidents for four years. In August 1970, the beast returned. A 14-year-old boy awoke from sleep to a torch shining in his face. Again, he was attacked as the others were, but this time, when he was being led back to his house, the masked man spoke to him. He told the boy to stay quiet, because if you don't, someone will harm your mother and father. When the boy's parents found him, he was disheveled and upset, but wouldn't speak of what had happened to him. Eventually, he told them and was taken to hospital, where an examination showed that he too had the scratches down his torso that had covered the girl four years earlier. In addition, the boy told police that the man had spiky black hair and was wearing a frightening mask. On the 10th of July, 1970, two officers cruised around the island on their regular night patrol. It was almost midnight when they stopped at a red light in the St. Helier district when a car ran the stoplight. The officers chased the driver, who was trying desperately to escape. He drove on the wrong side of the road, up embankments and onto footpaths. 
but eventually crashed into a hedge and finally stopped in a tomato field. When he exited the car, he began to run, as did the officers chasing him. He was eventually tackled to the ground and arrested. On the ride to the police headquarters, officers noticed a musty smell coming from the man, and once they were finally under the bright strip lighting of the station, they saw the man's appearance for the first time. He wore a long, dark coat with inch-long nails and screws sticking out of the collar, cuffs and shoulders. These were what made the marks on the young girl and boy. When they emptied the man's pockets, they found a black torch with tape covering most of the glass, so only a pinprick of light would shine through. Two pieces of cord were used for tying up his victims, a wool cap and duct tape. They also found a spiky black wig and the mask he had been using to terrorize his victims. After 14 years, the Beast of Jersey had been captured. Born in 1925, 46-year-old Edward Paisnell was a family man with a wife and children. He worked in construction and came from a wealthy family. He didn't have a criminal record, but was imprisoned for a month during World War II by German officers when he stole food for starving families. He played Santa Claus at the children's foster home that his wife worked at, and the kids called him Uncle Ted. But Edward Paisnell had another side to him, including a low sex drive and at least one mistress. However, his wife never suspected anything, and their marriage appeared to be normal. When questioned about the outfit he was wearing and why he was speeding, he told investigators that he was going to an orgy and didn't want to be recognized. As for the nails, he said that he added those in case he was attacked by someone who knew martial arts. He refused to talk about the mask and the wig, which had been worn that night, judging by the marks on his face. Paisnell was remanded in custody and officers were sent to search his home. Once in the house, they found a locked secret room inside his bedroom. It smelled of must and they found old clothing and homemade wigs, complete with matching false eyebrows. They discovered a camera and photographs of houses across the island. Investigators believed that he had been planning his attacks for years and had many more lined up. When they asked Paisnell about the photographs, he told them he chose his victims years before the crimes. He knew specific details about the families and their homes and knew which windows to climb into on the night of the assaults. They also found his shrine to Satan, which included an altar, a sword, and an extensive collection of books about black magic and the occult. On the 29th of November, 1971, it took a jury 38 minutes to find Edward Paisnell guilty of 13 counts of rape, indecent assault, and sodomy against six of his victims. He was sentenced to 30 years in Winchester Prison in the UK, but was released in 1991 after 20 years served for good behavior. He tried to move back to Jersey, but due to the reign of terror he held for so many years, he wasn't welcome, and instead, he moved to the Isle of Wight. He died three years later from a heart attack in 1994. In 2007, a child abuse investigation named Operation Rectangle began, which oversaw the investigation into foster care abuse that had been going on for decades. In 2008, during a search of a home that housed up to 60 children at a time, officers found 65 milk teeth in the basement, many belonging to older children who would have already shed them. They also found shackles under the dirt, which were attached to the walls. Children were abused by staff, and for a long time, it was believed that Edward Paisnell was a part of the conspiracy due to his involvement in the foster care system, but police have since confirmed he wasn't part of the inquiry. Though he was only charged with 13 counts, it's believed that he assaulted many, many more people than the number who came forward. For more information about this case, please see the show notes. Thank you for watching. We'll see you back here soon.